Oh, cool. <laughs> so welcome to the morning session. It's the second part of program re uh, genome rearrangement. And uh, it, was a, it was actually supposed to be an RNA session, <coughs> but there was only one abstract submitted to that session. So we decided to extend the genome rearrangement into two different sessions. So we're going to have four interesting talks, two longer ones, two shorter ones. And uh, so we start with, with Eric Meyer. And uh, looking forward to your talk. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, first, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. And so it will be about transgener transgenerational epigenetic inheritance of uh, genome rearrangement patterns, um, as uh, you may imagine. And I want to present um, results that actually uh, change the way um, the, we see the action of scanarnies. We, for a very long time, we thought that the um, epigenetic uh, mechanism through which the scanarnies were mediating this uh, inheritance of uh, the rearrangement patterns were, was exclusively due to maternal uh, scanarnies. But as I will show, paternal scanarnies finally turn out to be uh, just as efficient as maternal scanarnies. Uh, I'll try to explain why this question is important and why we got interested in it. Um, I had included a few uh, introduction slides, but the system's been presented a number of times already, so I guess I'll skip most of them. Just show the pictures to remind you. The MAC is the germline. The MAC is the somatic nucleus where genes are expressed. And what happens uh, during... Um, look at the pointer. Uh, <clears throat> during sexual reproduction is that the mites undergo meiosis and then fertilization and then from the zygotic nucleus you're going to differentiate two uh, new mites and two new mics and during this time the old mic in paramecium fragments in about 30 fragments which will soon disappear after the process is completed. Um, so, as you know, also during MAC development, uh, two main types of DNA rearrangements occur. So the first type is fragmentation of MIC chromosomes with the elimination of uh, repeated sequences like mini satellites and transposons that often result in the fragmentation of, oops, what do I do? How do I get back? Okay, sorry. Um, uh, which results in, um, in the fragmentation of my chromosomes. But I will focus more on the excision of IESs, which are the short uh, intervening DNA segments that you can find throughout the germline genome. And actually, most of them are in paramecium are inserted with encoding sequences. So here, precise excision is really needed to reconstitute functional genes. So you've shown that slide also a number of times. The only thing that is conserved between all IESs in the genome is this TA repeats at both ends, which neatly recombine into one during the process of excision. And, uh, but other than that, uh, most of the, I mean, nearly all of the 45,000 different IESs have a unique sequence. Uh, they are short elements and non-coding. And um, the, conserv the poor conservation of, it, of this consensus at the ends of the uh, IESs had long suggested that they derived the, uh, from insertions of transposable elements a long time ago that rapidly decayed by mutations and deletions into these short, non-coding, uh, unique copy sequences. Um, but um, I should uh, pause here for a second and um, make you consider the point that, in fact, that consensus you can calculate does not contain sufficient information to specify the excision of uh, IESs across the genome. And um, uh, it's actually neither necessary nor sufficient because some IESs conform very poorly to the consensus, except for the TA, which is absolutely required for the excision reaction. And uh, on the other hand, you can find many matches to the uh, perfect matches to the consensus in opposite orientations at, at reasonable distances in MAC sequences that nevertheless do not get excised during MAC development. So this uh, consensus is interesting because it tells something perhaps about the evolutionary um, uh, origin of IESs, and in fact we have accumulated uh, some evidence that indeed 
at least a large fraction of IESs do derive from insertion of um, DNA transposons mostly, but not only. And, uh, and, but it doesn't tell us how the cell is able to recognize the DNA segments that are supposed to be excised in the first place. So uh, this is just to remind you that this is some, somehow a distinct question for the, from the question of how this piece of DNA is, is mechanistically cut and then the flanking sequences are rejoined. Uh, there is a first question of how the decision to uh, eliminate that segment is taken. And this, this question so has um, been our focus for a number of years. And uh, it has now been partly solved, I would say, by the discovery of the scan RNA pathway, um, which, um, uh, which, are, uh, which is a uh, meiosis-specific small RNA pathway, which is required for recognition of at least a fraction of IESs. So as you can see on this snapshot of the mapping uh, of a deep sequencing of scan RNAs from an early conjugation time point, this is just to uh, make it clear that scan RNAs actually cover the entire germline genome in paramecium, which is different from what we have learned in tetrahymena. Uh, and the coverage is actually very homogeneous uh, you can find them on both strands of exons, introns, uh, IESs, which are these green boxes here, intergenic regions, uh, transposable elements. Everything is converted into scan RNAs during meiosis. And so you can think of scan RNAs initially produced uh, as, um, as a, a RNA image of the complexity of the germline genome in the form of these 25 nucleotide fragments. Now, if they are produced from the entire germline genome, the question arises, how's, how do they help in the recognition of IESs? And so I'll just briefly show the current model for genome scanning, which is supposed to explain how this is happening. And so it's an old model that most of you already know. It's still the uh, best I think we have so far, even though it may not be entirely um, correct or uh, not very precise in some aspects. So as I said, the scan RNAs are going to, uh, in fact, uh, their name in fact derives from the fact that they are supposed to scan the maternal genome that was uh, rearranged in the previous generation, uh, uh, which I'm showing here, so the mic is here, genes are in green, here is a transposon in orange, an IES here that has to be precisely excised in the MAC and the transposon will be eliminated and fragment the MAC chromosome. And so um, the scan RNA is actually mediate the comparison of these two genomes prior to development of the new macronucleus so as to compute what has to be done in the next generation. And uh, they will do so by um, actually engaging in pairing interactions with uh, non-coding transcripts that are produced from the entire maternal MAC genome, uh, as far as we can tell, on both strands, but at very low levels. So this transcription has nothing to do like, uh, with like a transcription of a messenger RNA. It's very low levels, but nevertheless, you can detect it by strand-specific RT-PCR wherever you test it. And in the mic, then, as I said, only during uh, meiosis, more precisely prophase of meiosis one, the germline genome is also entirely transcribed on both strands. And then uh, this results in the formation of double-stranded RNA, which is then diced into these 25 nucleotide scan RNA duplexes uh, by the uh, proteins diselect 2 and diselect 3. Now, um, these scan RNAs are then exported to the cytoplasm and they are loaded into two specific proteins called PV1 and PV9 in paramecium. And with the help of other proteins, uh, all of this is imported in the um, old macronucleus where uh, they have the capacity to actually uh, scan the previously rearranged genome. And this uh, provides uh, theoretically the information to distinguish those scan RNAs in green that can find a perfect match in the nascent transcripts of the old MAC uh, here in green from the ones in orange here that derive from mic limited sequences and cannot find a match. So the idea is that uh, the, the mic is undergoing meiosis and fertilization and then will ultimately give rise to the zygotic mic and the zygotic MAC, which is where you want to uh, reproduce the rearrangement patterns of the old MAC. And so the idea is that 
um, based on that selection, uh, only uh, the scan RNAs that could not find a match, that is the mic-specific scan RNAs, are going to be re-exported to the developing mic where they, where they can target elimination of the homologous DNA sequences. Now, this elimination does not occur directly, of course. Here, again, we think that um, this goes through uh, pairing interaction with nascent transcripts, which, like in many other eukaryotes, is going to lead to the deposition of epigenetic marks on these sequences. And in a second step, these epigenetic marks will be recognized by the excision complex containing the pigimac endonuclease and then cleaved out. So um, these epigenetic marks so far in Primisium, we um, know now uh, thanks to the work of uh, Sandra Joko, who showed that EZL1 is actually uh, responsible for uh, histone H3, K9, and K27 methylation, and that's at, uh, at least in a fraction of IESs, and that this is also, uh, absolutely required for uh, rearrangement. Um, uh, it may be that there are other epigenetic marks that we don't know yet, because it's, uh, as, uh, as um, it was pointed out, I think, yesterday, it is actually difficult to imagine how nucleosome modifications can regulate the excision of very short sequences. But, um, so, uh, basically, this model is also not uh, com uh, completely certain, I would say, for the moment, because, in particular, the fate of the MAC matching scan RNAs remains an open question, I believe. Uh, in tetrahamina, it's been shown, or it's been uh, shown, yes, let's say, <laughs> that scan RNAs are actually degraded upon finding a perfect match in the old MAC, so that's a simple, uh, the simplest uh, mechanism you can imagine. They get degraded, so only the MAC-specific ones are left, and that's how you explain the specificity of rearrangement. Now, in Paramecium, several groups have reported some sort, some sort of partial evidence that indeed they might be degraded faster than the mic-specific scan RNAs, but, I, but, but quantitatively, uh, they, they don't completely disappear to the end of the time course, and so it's difficult to imagine that this uh, is uh, the basis for the specificity of IES excision. It may be, in fact, that uh, the, scan RNA, the MAC scan RNAs simply remain sequestered in the old MAC, uh, as, as shown here, rather than being degraded. It may also be that finally um, they are somehow licensed as MAC matching rather than MAC specific, but nevertheless go on to the developing MAC just like the MAC specific ones, where they could potentially have the opposite effect of protecting homologous sequences from deletion, and in that case they would function exactly like the pi RNAs that were described in Oxectrica, where in fact the pi RNAs determine what is kept rather than what is deleted. So it's, I, I want you to bear in mind that it's fully possible that both uh, sides of the mechanism exist in paramecium. Now, um, at least the, the value of this model is that it explains what we have been calling maternal control of IES excision. And uh, I'm sh still showing that very old slide because, in fact, this is an observation that was made well before the dif discovery of the scan RNA pathway and which actually inspired the whole, uh, the whole uh, model. Um, IESs are normally absent from the MAC, but if you inject an IES inside the micronucleus of a vegetative cell here, one of two IESs uh, contained in the uh, MIC version of this gene, which must be precisely excised at each generation, we saw that in uh, the sexual progeny of the transformed clone, when it goes through autogamy, the, old, the transformed old MAC will be discarded and you will make a new MAC and a new MIC from the germline that has not been affected by transformation. <laughs> Nevertheless, the presence of the IES sequence will re result in the specific retention of the homologous IES uh, in the next generation, whereas all other IESs are normally excised. So I should say, um, this does not, uh, when we saw this, we tested the number of IESs and we've, uh, we soon figured out that it does not work for all IESs. Uh, we tested manually about 15 IESs at that time and we found that about a third of them would be sensitive to the presence of homologous sequences in the old MAC and we call these maternally controlled IESs. 
Um, but in those cases, and when it's really efficient, the retention of the IES at this generation is just forever, because if you do an additional round of autogamy, again, the fact that this is present in the maternal macronucleus actually uh, leads to retention. So this is fully explained by uh, the scan RNA model I showed you, because the presence of this IES here would actually titrate the scan RNAs that are made from the mag during meiosis and preventing them from going to the new mag uh, to target uh, deletions. Uh, so the, the, the news is that this, um, the latest news about the scan RNA pathway, there, are, there were uh, mostly two recent studies, genome-wide studies by the groups of Sandra Duarcourt and Marius Novatsky. And the somewhat disappointing result is that if you knock down the scan RNA pathway by, for instance, uh, uh, doing RNAi against um, uh, Dicelac 2, Dicelac 3 proteins, or the PV1, PV9 proteins, or in fact a number of other proteins also believed to be involved in the scan RNA pathway. Well, in fact, only about 10% of IESs get retained, and 90% of them apparently just don't need scan RNA for their excision. So in this respect, I think we are back to the starting question of how these IESs may be recognized. However, I mean, the, the, this, this model is certainly valid for a number of IESs, and it's absolutely required for the elimination of transposable elements. That's what I meant to say, in fact. So uh, whenever you touch anything in the scan RNA pathway, the elimination of transposable elements is completely blocked, and they will be maintained in a new map. And so we also sort of guess that those IESs that are uh, actually requiring the scan RNA pathway are the most recent IESs uh, that were inserted in the genome. In fact, there are still sort of transposons in the process of becoming single copy IESs, uh, so suggesting that this is a, a natural history of IESs to first be recognized by the scan RNA pathway, but after some evolutionary time, uh, become these uh, hardwired single copy unique sequences that will be excised no matter what. I'm saying no matter what, but we still don't know how because there's still no signal in the sequence to excise them. So this is another important question. But before my time is over, <laughs> I want to um, <clears throat> uh, tell you also that the scan RNA pathway we showed a number of years ago is responsible for the maternal inheritance of mating types that was described by Tracy Sandoborn soon after he discovered them in the 1930s. Uh, here, just as a reminder, the Mendelian segregation of a pair of alleles in a cross of paramecium because it's a reciprocal fertilization. The two F1s are always genetically identical. Nevertheless, when mating type O is crossed with mating type E, uh, the F1 cell from the O cell will remain O, and the F1 cell from the e, cell, uh, e parent will remain E, and autogamy also does not change mating types. So obviously, mating types are not genetically determined, yet Sunderborn showed that it was determined in the macronucleus itself during its development. And uh, we then identified the MTA gene as, being con as controlling mating types. This is a transmembrane protein that actually is specifically expressed in E cells and will mediate the recognition of O and E cells during conjugation. So uh, the reason why the MTA gene is not expressed in O cells is simply because the promoter of the gene is excised in the MAC as an IES. I'm saying as an IES because in that case it's a co-opted IES. It does not derive from the insertion of a transposable element. It's a functional part of the gene containing the promoter that recruited the IES excision machinery and scan RNA pathway to target the excision and produce this sexual polymorphism. So because the scan RNA pathway is required for targeting the MTA promoter, then this is why uh, you get this maternal inheritance. But um, the idea that uh, we had is that uh, this maternal inheritance was actually uh, due to the fact that, that, that there was little cytoplasmic exchange during the conjugation between the two mates. And in fact, in normal times, there's only a very tiny fusion where the gametic nuclei can be exchanged between the two conjugates. But um, uh, Sunderborn had shown already a long time ago that if you uh, induce a large cytoplasmic bridge during conjugation, you see something completely different because now the two, the two F1 cells become mating type E. And so this gave us the idea that the scan RNA pathway production, sorting, and action finally was largely confined to each cytoplasm. 
but uh, if this is the case, then we suddenly realize that there would be a problem when you cross different strains that are polymorphic for IES excisions. For, so we can have two cases of insertion polymorphisms. For instance, here we have an allele in one strain that contains an IES, but in another strain the, the homologous allele does not have an IES in the mic. And so in that case, we would expect that that cell can produce a scan RNAs that would uh, actually target excision of the IES in this F1 cell. But uh, if the scan RNAs are confined to each cytoplasm, this cell would be left without any scan RNA to recognize this IES, and therefore it would be retained on this allele in the F1 and in the F2s that inherit this allele through the maternal effect. So that would actually produce a non-functional gene, and this would be detrimental in cases of IES insertion polymorphisms. Very similarly, if you imagine a case where two homologous, two allelic IESs in one gene have diverged in sequence to the point that the scan RNAs made from one cannot rec recognize the other allele, you would have exactly the same problem, and you would expect that in the F1s, only the maternal allele is, is, uh, is correctly rearranged, while the paternal allele is not, and reciprocally on the other side. This situation would actually be very similar to the maternal requirement for pi RNAs in Drosophila to control transposable element. I want to draw this uh, analogy because we know that in paramecium, uh, interstrain crosses very often result in very significant F2 lethality. I will be talking about the cross between 51 and 32 uh, strains, and in that case, about 80% of the F2s will die. Only 20% of them survive. So we're trying to understand why. This is why that question is important. So we decided to actually test this question, and um, so as I said, this is important because we know it from paramecium tetralia analysis that a large fraction of IESs was, were inserted right before the whole genome duplication, uh, right after the whole genome duplication that just preceded the explosion of uh, speciation events giving rise to the paramecium Aurelia complex. And as uh, Diamantis Celis uh, told you yesterday, we now know that indeed there is now a large number of IESs that are specific to each species within this complex. So the question is, does this IES polymorphism, uh, did it actually promote speciation within the complex? And so uh, we first tested that case where, uh, such, such a case where the two allelic IESs were where an, uh, an IES is present in, the, in, in, the, uh, in each of the alleles, but uh, they are, have diverged in sequence to the, fact that, to the point where they don't align anymore at all. This is an IES in the G surface antigen gene, which, which is called G4404. So what my PhD student, Guillaume Perrin, did was actually quantify this in a number of pairs where he isolated the F1s, grew them, and did this PCR. Uh, in a, a little specific manner because the genes are sufficiently divergent that you can test IES excision on each allele separately. And of course, IES excision is a quantitative thing that you sometimes you see some excision and some retention. And so what he did is just sort of uh, st statistics uh, on a wild type cross and that's what he saw. So in fact, as you can see, this is not what we expected. We don't see any specific, uh, very significant retention uh, of the paternal IES in the cross. We do see uh, occasional re uh, clones that have high levels of retention and this may be significant when compared to the control homozygous cross 51 by 51, where excision is almost nearly perfect, so it might be significant, but nevertheless, these cases do not specifically arise on the paternal allele, so apparently they are not due to the lack of maternal scan RNAs. So let's put this question on the side, I'll come back to it later, uh, and let's say just that globally, IESs are rather well excised. So the, you know, we know that these two IESs are dependent on scan RNAs, so we actually, um, uh, we're left with the hypothesis that, for instance, uh, the excision of uh, this uh, allele here, uh, sorry, the 32 allele on the 51 side, should be due to scan RNAs that are initially produced in the 32 parent. And to test this, uh, so I want to show the second experiment first, is that uh, Guillaume actually knocked out the PV1 and PV9 proteins in the 51 parent just prior to the cross. So these are the proteins that mediate scan RNA action. 
And as you can see, the result is that, as expected, the 51 uh, allele is not rearranged in, in the F1 giraffe for the 51 parent, but similarly, it's also not rearranged in the, uh, on the 51 allele in uh, the F1 deriving from the 32 parent. Conversely, if you knock out P1 and P9 in the 32 parent, now you see exactly the opposite, that the 32 allele is not correctly rearranged, but this time in both F1s as well. And if you knock out these two genes in the two parents, as expected, you, you get a retention everywhere. So I would say this normally is lethal, but silencing of PV1 and PV9 is not always 100%, and this was tested on surviving clones in this experiment. So now I have to, something else you did is using as a 51 parent, the IES plus cell line that maintains the IES in the, in the old MAC. And in that case also, you would expect the scan RNAs produced by the 51 cell uh, to be titrated by the old mic. And the question is, what happens on the other side? The answer is indeed, uh, in that case, the 51 allele is also not correctly rearranged on the other side. So definitely, it's quite clear that, that um, paternal scan RNAs can act to target excision of the paternal allele in the other cell, right? And, um, so I've shown that already. A second, but there's a second case of polymorphism uh, <clears throat> that is, um, sorry, yes, uh, uh, the case where you have an IES in one allele but not in the other. And in that particular case, we, what we saw is, in fact, there is a, also a significant effect of excision in a number of crones, but this does not differ between the two sides. Here he's only measuring the retention of IES in the 51 allele because there's just one uh, IES and the other allele does not have any. Uh, similarly, uh, if you uh, use an IES plus parent for the 51 strain, then again, you don't get this, uh, uh, um, you, you, you can block this excision very efficiently in both F1s. And also, if you silence PB1 and PB9 in the 51 parent prior to the cross, then you are blocking the excision. This is also, of course, an IES that is kind of RNA dependent. So, um, as a, what did I do? Was I, was I, <laughs> was I, I <laughs> Okay, sorry. So, uh, as a conclusion, I think these data actually show that paternal scan RNAs can very f efficiently program excision of scan RNA dependent IESs. Um, but they, uh, they may be, they may actually think about how this happens. They may, they may do it in two different ways. It may be that the very little amount of cytoplasm that is nevertheless exchanged between conjugates contain sufficient amount of PE proteins loaded with scan RNAs to actually mediate their action in the other X conjugate. Indeed, when we look at a, a, tagged, a GFP tagged PE protein transformed into one of the parents, you can very clearly see after conjugation some GFP signal in the other X conjugate. But that, as you can notice as well, it's much lower, and the question is, would we have enough quantitatively scan RNAs in the other partner to actually mediate excision of all ISs? So uh, another possibility is that, in fact, the results of the genomic subtraction of scan RNAs is imprinted directly in the gametic nuclei before cross-fertilization and maintained as a form of imprint throughout development until the time when these have to be rearranged. Uh, so these two hypotheses actually are not exclusive. At this point, I think we cannot distinguish them, uh, but um, uh, I would just point out uh, to come back to the mating type uh, story that, in fact, so that what this means is that here we're saying that the scan RNA is produced from the, in the O cell and licensed as mic specific because the MTA promoter is not present in the old mic, should normally go to the other cell and target excision, but as we should, uh, they, uh, they would be re uh, titrated by the presence of the homologous sequence in the old MAC. The difference with the cross that I showed is that here both uh, alleles of the MTA promoter are exactly the same, so cross recognition by scan RNAs is possible. And what happens when you have a large cytoplasmic fusion, which is the same case as tetrahamina, when where transformation of one MAC would result in an effect in both X conjugates is the fact that those scan RNAs produced from the uh, uh, mating type O cell would be entirely titrated 
by the presence of the old uh, homologous sequence in the old mic. And for this, you do require more cytoplasmic exchange than you normally see. So I'll stop here. And uh, I just, uh, just sorry, I forgot to part of the conclusion, which is that uh, in the case of the MTB, so th we cannot imagine that divergence of IES sequences will actually result in hybrid dysgenesis in the Drosophila sense. And, cannot possibly contribute to speciation as much as we can see. However, there is this other effect that when you have one IES in an allele and no IES in the other allele, and now this is a genetic effect because it occurs on both sides, but it looks like the fact that there is an IES without an, uh, an allele without an IES actually blocks excision on the allele that does contain one, and this saves so, sort of the hybrid dysgenesis hypothesis and the idea that a yes insertion polymorphism could have driven speciation in the Parmesan malaria complex. Thank you for your attention and um, okay. <laughs> All right, um, we actually run out of time for questions, but uh, maybe one short or two short questions. Do you, think, do you think the PV protein is from the mic going over or to the cytoplasm, to the next cell? Well, that, that's the one thing we cannot distinguish. In fact, there's three possibilities. It can be inside the gametic nucleus. It could be in the site, uh, around it with the little cytoplasm that is exchanged. Or it could, actually the PV protein, we, we know from the, um, in fact, some of it must be in the cytoplasm because we see, it, with this GFP picture, we see it in the old mic of the other cell. So they must be free to enter the old mic in the other cell, right? But it does not mean that they have not gone inside the mic and gone out of it after depositing an imprint somehow. So the two things are really not exclusive. So I'm going to ask you about the non-maternal IESs. Ah. So you said that the, the basically the, the consensus sequence isn't enough to recognize them. So do you have any favorite hypothesis how those are recognized? Uh, no, there's just for, for the moment just speculative ideas, but they must be recognized in some particular way that is not based purely on DNA sequence, right? So. All right, thank you. We should move on to the next speaker. Thank you, Eric. So, um...